So how does the F test work? It works the same way that it did in regression by breaking out the total variability into that which we can explain by using our explanatory variable and that which we'd left unexplained even after using our explanatory variable. So let's look at its components. We've got variability between groups and variability that's left over within groups. So our between groups variability, we might call SSB. This is similar to SS reg and regression. And we can see that because we've got our group mean versus our overall mean. And we want to see how different is that group mean from that overall or grand mean. This is still our explained variability because we can explain this difference by using those group means. So if we go back to the beer goggles example, we've got the group mean for those who, the group mean attractiveness for those who, great, uh, for those who drank four pints of lager is about 45. And the group mean attractiveness for those who drank two pints of lager is about 65. And the group mean attractiveness for those who drank no beer is also about 65. So on average, those who drank zero or two pints of lager talk to people who are about the same attractiveness, but those who drank four pints of lager talk to people who are much less attractive on average. So the question is, how much do these group means vary from the overall mean? Well, the overall mean is about 59. And so what we want to know is, let me draw that a little bit neater, we want to know is if 59 or so is about the overall mean, how much do these group means differ from that overall mean? So this is just some measure of between groups variability. So we can see that for those who drank four pints of lager, there's quite a bit of difference. But for those who drank zero or two pints of lager, that difference between those groups is quite small. <clears throat> then, after we've explained the differences between the groups, we might consider how much variability is left over is unexplained. So that would be our within groups variability. Now this would be kind of like our residuals or SSE from regression but we'll call this SSW for within groups now. And what we're looking at is our individual observations versus the overall mean, or excuse me, versus our group mean. So within each group, how different do our observations, how different are our observations? So let's look at the four pint group. So on average, They measured, uh, they talked to people who ranked about a 45 on the attractiveness scale. But one person talked to someone who ranked about a 20. How different were they from that group mean? Another person talked to a partner who ranked about a 70. How different were they from that average attractiveness for people who just drank 40 pint, uh, four pints? And then we can see some variability just generally within the group. So for each individual in this group, they had differences from that group mean. No one was right on the group mean. There was all different attractiveness, uh, attractiveness for each partner for everyone who drank four pints. We can also look at that, uh, the same kind of idea for people who drank zero pints of lager. The average attractiveness for people who drank zero pints of lager was at about 65. Someone in that zero pint group talked to someone with an attractiveness rating of about 80. Someone else talked to someone with an attractiveness of about 40. But no one was right at 65. Everyone differed. We can't explain why everyone didn't talk to someone with the same attractiveness. So this is really just how much did everyone or did each individual 
in each group differ from that group average. So if we look at SSB, that explained variability, and then we look at what's left over, that unexplained variability, well, explained and then unexplained, together they give us that total variability. Because what's not explained is unexplained, and together that's everything. So then we have this idea of the total variability, which is SS total. And all total variability is, is how is different is each individual from the overall mean. So here, I don't care what group everyone was in, I just care what was the attractiveness rating for a given person, and then how far away from the grand mean. Well, the grand mean is about 59, so it's about here, and that's the average attractiveness for everyone, regardless of the, how drunk the person was, or how, regardless of how much alcohol the person was that they had been talking to. And we see that there are some very big differences overall, but there are also some very small differences overall. So the purpose of the ANOVA or the F-test is to see how different or how much of this total variability can be broken up into this explained source. This total variability we can see is quite big. The explained variability is, or the within or unexplained variability has been broken up and is a lot smaller. So we want to get rid of a lot of that noise, that unexplained variability, and explain, like, and see how much of this total variability can be accounted for or explained by using the amount of alcohol that someone has consumed. That's what the purpose of the ANOVA is. It's literally breaking apart that total variability into two pieces. So we've got this between, which is the same thing as explained. And we've got within, or error, which is the same thing as unexplained. And this is breaking out everything the same way we saw with regression. So the between degrees of freedom is G minus one. But this is the same thing as the number of parameters minus one, which is what we saw in multiple regression. The within, or error, degrees of freedom is n minus g. But that's also the same thing as the total number of observations minus the number of parameters. Now how is it that we have g parameters? Well, g is the number of groups. So for example, I have the zero pint group, the two pint group, and the four pint group. So that means I need to estimate the mean for zero pints, the mean for two pints, and the mean for four pints. That is g equals three group means, so the number of parameters is g, which in this case is three. So the number of population means that I have, or the number of groups that I've identified, is the number of parameters. It's the number of parameters in my null hypothesis in this case. So this relationship between the multiple regression ANOVA table and the ANOVA table here is exactly the same. What we saw in multiple regression before for our total degrees of freedom was the number of uh, observations minus one, and that still holds. And that is actually also equal to degrees of freedom between plus the degrees of freedom within. So the degrees of freedom are still additive. It turns out that our degrees of freedom for between, or sums of squares between plus the sums of squares within also equals the sums of squares total. So we could either call this SSE, if you're familiar with that, comfortable with that language from regression, or SSW. So you can use either of those notations. I like between and within because I think it really helps us illustrate what's going on when we're comparing means between groups and we're comparing individuals within as a group. The mean squares 
it's the exact same thing that we saw in regression. It's sum squares divided by degrees of freedom. So our mean squares for between is going to be sums of squares between divided by degrees of freedom between. The mean squares for within is sums of squares within divided by degrees of freedom within. There is no mean squares for total. Our f obs, same thing as before. It's the ratio of explained over unexplained variability. So it's mean squares between over mean squares within. And that's it. It's interpreted the same way. It's found the same way. So let's go back to our comprehending ambiguous prose. We had found the F ratio in the output before, but now let's see what the entire ANOVA table looks like. If you'll remember, we had before, after, and none as our groups. So we had G equals 3. There were also 19 plus 19 plus 19 equals 57 observations because there were 19 people randomly assigned to each of those three groups. So now we have enough information to find our degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom for the condition, so this is between, is going to be G minus 1, which is 3 minus 1, or 2. The degrees of freedom for error, well this is within, that's going to be N minus G, and that will be 57 minus 3, which is 54. And our corrected total, so our total degrees of freedom, this is going to be n minus 1, and that's just 56. To get our sum of squares total, we're just going to add these two pieces, SSB plus SSE, or SSW. And to do that, we just get 129, and I'm going to round 0.58. Our mean squares, this is SS divided by degrees of freedom. So our mean squares for between, for the condition, is 35 divided by 2, so that's 17.53 with some rounding. To get our mean squares for error or for within, we do SS within divided by degrees of freedom within, so it's 94 divided by 54, and that gives us 1.75. Our F ratio, this is MSB divided by MSW, so that's 17.53 divided by 1.75, and that gives us that 10.012 that we saw in the previous uh, video. In our p-value, we would get this from jump. Using the degrees of freedom we've identified, we get a p-value of 0 0.002 from jump, the distribution calculator. Now, I've been making a lot of references back to multiple regression, and we saw in chapter 10 that the two-sample t-test could be related to regression. And as ANOVA is kind of like an extension of the two-sample t-test, it's not that surprising, I hope, that ANOVA can also be related to regression. So for example, we can use a regression model to analyze the data even when we have a categorical variable with more than one level. We just need more than one indicator variable. So for example, our regression model might be mu y equals alpha plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2, we these are both indicator variables. This is our population model. It has parameters, which are alpha, beta 1, and beta 2. If I want my prediction equation, I would write this as y hat equals a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2, and I know this is my sample equation, or my prediction equation, because it has statistics, a, b1, and b2. And I'm predicting a response y hat, not mu. So let's use the prose example, the ambiguous prose example. 
let's say x1 equals 1 if picture is before the text, 0 otherwise. x2 is another indicator variable, and that will be 1 if the picture is after the text, 0 otherwise. So that means our default or baseline group is no picture. So I could create an X3, meaning the no group, but that's just redundant information because if the picture is not presented before the text and not presented after the text, then there's just no picture presented. So let's think about what our sample statistics now are. So y hat equals a, that's just going to be y bar for the no picture group. Because if y hat equals a, then b1 times x1 is 0 goes to 0, plus b2 times x2 equals 0 goes to 0. So that means it's not before and it's not after, then that means I'm just looking at the group that had not before and not after, so no picture. Let's see what happens if I do y hat equals a plus b1. Well, for that to happen, I must be looking at when x1 equals 1. So if x1 equals 1, then the picture was presented before, not after, so this must be the same as y bar before. And b1 is the difference between y bar before and y bar none. Finally, what happens if I do y hat equals a plus b2? Well, this must be then when x1 equals 0 and x2 equals 1. So this must be y bar after. Because this can only happen when x2 equals 1. And that means that b2 is the difference between the after and none group. So if I were to do an ANOVA on this multiple regression model, it would be exactly the same as the ANOVA we just looked at. I would get the same F and the same p-value. I would get the same sums of squares. But I would be estimating instead of means, I'd be estimating sample slopes. but I could get to those sample means using my sample slopes as we just saw.